Hello there. Uh, a warm, warm welcome to everybody joining us uh, today uh, for this IS Entity Connect session that we've got late in the afternoon here in London. Um, we're looking today at the, at the kind of novel approaches for fighting leishmaniasis. We wanted to have a, a little bit of a look both at the discovery side in terms of um, putting pipeline structures through a pipeline to development to kind of reformulation at the other end uh, in terms of uh, strategies at the other end of the leishmaniasis pipeline. So we've got two uh, excellent presentations today. Uh, one is from Dr. Miguel Angel Havers from Magali, from he's the head of computational biology and chemistry research group. So kind of in silico approaches at the University, the Catholic University of Santa Maria in uh, Peru. Um, and then we also have Professor Kishore Wasan, the co-founder and co-director of the Neglected Global Diseases Initiative at the University of British Columbia in Canada. So a warm, warm welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us today. Um, I think uh, what we wanted to do today was really try and encapsulate some of the, um, as you all know, there's a lot of activity in this space at the moment, um, you know, in terms of uh, activity both at the drug discovery side, at the vector control side, a lot of movement, a lot of momentum. And by that, I mean, it was only in February uh, where the, the WHO were looking at kind of um, really looking at the way insecticides are monitored for, for resistance within the vector, the sand fly, and then looking at a kind of operational manual on uh, leishmaniasis vector control, surveillance, monitoring and evaluation. So two kind of landmark studies by the WHO. Uh, earlier on, in terms of the, uh, the curative side, there's a lot of activity uh, leading the charge that the one of the world's most famous PDPs, the most successful PDP, the DNDI, who are in their 20th year um, in terms of uh, their activity, looking at uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis in terms of their uh, combination therapies and trials that are, are running, as well as an interesting access programs that they started uh, looking at in, in Africa to, to address the access issues around that as well. So there's a lot of activity in here. One of the, one of the kind of uh, things that we always hear when we talk about uh, neglected properties is, is there's not enough coming through the pipeline, right? So there's not enough new, there are not enough new kind of uh, compounds or, or structures or candidates being pushed through the pipeline. So why we chose Peru actually to have a look at this is that the whole Latin American region is one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. And actually the World Bank itself, they classify Peru as a mega diverse country um, in the sense that it's got over, I, I believe, 20,000 species, uh, between 20 and 25,000 species of flora. And out of that, uh, for those individual species, about four to 5,000 of those are used in medicinal settings. So there's a lot of pharmacognosy knowledge locked into uh, the population of Peru. And so we thought it'd be very interesting to see how that vast kind of um, sea of biodiversity can be translated into from a, from, from a pharmacognosy setting into a kind of more robust scientific kind of setting. So this, uh, the computational approaches, the, the databasing of this, looking at those structures, and then just have a look at what is needed to push those through in terms of perhaps next steps, validation against animal models, this uh, question of manufacturing in terms of scale up from milligram to gram, onwards to clinical trials. Look at the, 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 that kind of movement that's needed, and that'll probably come from in the Q&A at, at the end. And whilst at the same time, we'll just have a look at what's happening at the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, uh, in terms of addressing issues around thermal stability, uh, access, uh, cost effectiveness, and have a look at the way, uh, well, in, in this case, the, the uh, UBC uh, Neglected Global Disease Initiative are putting forward their oral amphoceratin new uh, B um, uh, reformulation uh, effort and see how that sits in, in the landscape. So they're the two kind of uh, poles, uh, as it were, the two polarities that we're trying to uh, cover today. I think that's kind of more than enough. I mean, I think that's a good segue to bring in uh, onto the floor um, the first speaker for today, Dr. Miguel Angel Habes from Magali. Before I do that, I just wanted to speak a little bit of a shout out to some of the attendees that are joining us from all over the world. Um, I know we've got people like Isaac Niambo from, from Tanzania. We've got other 
uh, people in terms of the other attendees that are coming on. Please give your name and your organization and country and we'll give you a shout out as well. So thank you very much for joining us. I think that's enough from me. I'll hand the floor over to Miguel. So Miguel, over to you. Hello and over to you. Hello. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me and see my presentation? Per yeah, perfectly. I'm, I'm just going to back out and I'll hand the floor over to you. There you go. Well, thanks, thanks, uh, Marianne and Cameron for for the invitation. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. I'm honored to to share this this session with with Professor Kishore. And my talk will be a, a computerized drug design approaches applied to, to to screen natural products for potential antileishmanial compounds. Well, my my name is Miguel, and I'm, I am the head of the computational biology and chemistry research group from University University. Catholic, Catholic University of Santa Maria from Peru. Um, well, uh, Leishmaniasis is, is a, a complex disease which is known for ancient times. Uh, here in South America, uh, we we have a in Peru uh, the moche moche culture that is, uh, is 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 before the Incas. They they raised before the Incas and 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 then at that time they they the pick. They, they pictured in a, in, in a portrait vessel uh, the deformity is caused by by leishmaniasis. Now we can see here in this in this first figure, and and in in, in the Oriental Cemetery of Cojo in Chile, uh, they found uh, skulls with with deformities, uh, and they associated them with with uh, with leishmaniasis too. So this is this is a, a, a an ancient a, 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 a disease that 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 is known by humanity for 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 a very long time. But and and one what we have today nowadays we have the that the we have an increase in leishmaniasis incidence and prevalence all over the world. So it's not longer a problem of tropical uh, countries or, or poor countries we, as we see in the maps. Uh, provided by the World Health Organization, we have uh, a, a, a spread in, in in many cases uh, in in several parts of the world. So, in that in 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 this case in this case scenario, we have a a the a variety of reasons why is uh, this is spreading, and and most of the most important most of the most important uh, factors are man propelled. So we have a a, a problem here. And and, re, and regards of the human vaccine, we don't have yet a human vaccine for leishmaniasis, neither for for cutaneous leishmaniasis or for visceral leishmaniasis. Uh, uh, when we call it co a complex disease, is is because it's caused by a several species from the same parasite, and it causes a, a, a spectrum of disease. So it, it can cause a, a cutaneous form. Uh, ranging from a cutaneous form to a visceral form that is the, the most dangerous and, and fatal if not treated. So we don't have a, a, a human vaccine. The, the diagnosis of the disease has, has problems. And in, in the case scenario of, of treatment, we have a, a few options for, for treatment. And all these options have uh, had problems in, in, in the with the toxicity, with uh, stability, we have uh, we have different species have different uh, susceptibility to to, to to each of these these drugs. So this is a is a is a huge problem we, we faced, and all these drugs have a have a, a common a commonality, which is all of these drugs are repositioned drugs. So, which means that they are not. Uh, they are, have been uh, discovered. They use in a lucky way. Uh, they they were they are not drugs uh, developed for the for the treatment of leishmaniasis. So they have this uh, particularity of uh, all of these drugs. But in, in as as Kishore as as Cameron uh, uh, talked about and in his presentation in his first part of his presentation. There is a need for new uh, uh, entities, uh, pharmacological entities, to to, to face this this uh, worldwide problem. And one of the the uh, the, the sources 
for for this problem is that uh, the, the the parasite has a degenerative life cycle. So a part of this this cycle uh, it's it is ahead on the sunfly, and another part is in the human in, in humans. Uh, and and in the circle we have a, a mastigote forms, which is the form that is is found in the in the humans. And they have not only a, a, a macroscopic difference from from from, from mastigote, but this is a, a complete a transformation. They they change patterns of of, of protein uh, upregulation. They they upregulate and downregulate a several of, of 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 pathways to survive in in the in the macrophage in in the phagolysosomes of the macrophage, which is a a, a very hard environment and they and, and one of the the, the principal character, characteristic of this environment is, is its low ph so uh, if, if you want to develop a drought it may it may have the capacity to penetrate into the macrophage and selectively kill the 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 the, the, the parasite in, into the the phagolysosome so uh, that's 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 part of the problem with drug development because we are the most of the the, the pipelines are into promastigote. So this can this is not a, a very good approach. And natural products has been a, a major source of natural of, of pharmacological entities. As as a review by Newman and Craig in 2020, we have a a a 40 year a retrospective. Of new pharmacological pharmacological entities, and we and they uh, and they report that uh, most of the new entities, these pharmacological new entities, are from natural sources or derived from natural sources. As we uh, see in the uh, orange square, when we uh, focus on on antiparasitic uh, compounds, we see that that uh, most of these new entities are derived for, from natural products. So they can be an altered natural product, there will be deri derivates from natural products, or there, uh, uh, there can be synthetic drugs, but uh, they, they, are, they are being developed uh, upon natural products. So natural products are a major source. And, and I quote uh, the... Uh, the professor Newman and professor Craig, when uh, they uh, talk about the, that natural products still hold out the best option for finding novel uh, agents active and active templates, which, when working on a conjunction with synthetic chemists and biologists, offer the potential to discover novel structures that can lead to effective agents in a variety of human diseases. Well, uh, I, I think they 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 forgot by uh, by informaticians. But it, it's okay. So, uh, computerized drug design—it's a—it's a group of, met of bioinformatic methods that can be applied to 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 develop new new drug entities. So this this pipeline that we that we are observing in in the presentation are two two branches of of computerized drug design. One can be the structured base. Or can be the uh, or, or can be the ligand base. So in our in our work, we choose a, a structure base, and we select the uh, Leishmania reinase enzyme, which is uh, the the first enzyme of the polyamine pathway and catalyzes the conversion of l arginine and l ornithine and urea, down regulating the polyamine pathway, affecting the parasite growth and infectivity. So it's it's a, a well a well-known target in Leishmania. It has been recently uh, observed and, and showed its importance in, in mastigotes and in, and principally in, in Leishmania infantum, that is the the the, the, the species that causes um, visceral leishmaniasis in, in South America, and that's why we uh, uh, choose the, choose this this target and. In this in this work, we uh, apply uh, CAT techniques such as virtual screening, molecular docking, and molecular dynamic simulations to identify structural analogs of natural products that have demonstrated anti-leishmanial 
and anti-arginase activity, and that may be specifically to the Leishmania arginase. For this, we uh, we search in the in the Nube database, which is the the data one of the database that that holds uh, Brazilian <coughs> uh, natural products. It contains more than two thousand natural products and the rebates, and it's a it's, it's, it's the the the, um, the biggest. Uh, uh, database from from natural sources from Brazil. And in in the table we we show that uh, the six uh, na natural products that were selected, there there were there are some uh, physical chemical properties calculated. And then in, in in order to enhance our 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 search, we we use the chemical structure and molecular information approach, which uses the structural similarity is incorporated with molecular activity and other biological information to identify new association. In other words, it, it, if it looks like it may uh, have the same, uh, if the same properties. So we expect that we, in this case, we select uh, similar analogs, uh, structural analogs to these this, this natural products that have shown anti leishmania and anti arginase activity and they and these analogs will remain this this cap capabilities for this uh, we employ the swiss similarity uh, tool and selected the compound the, the single drug compound library which comprises more than no, no, 9 million molecules and for this uh, for this we have we selected uh, 1000 499 mole single molecules and uh, perform a virtual screening against uh, Leishman infantum arginase and Homo sapiens arginase. And we uh, we shown that only 25 of these compounds uh, been selectively selectivity uh, to Leishman infantum. So uh, in, in this case, we uh, selected them and as we talked uh, earlier, uh, there are a, a lot of, 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 of Leishmania species that causes disease. So we, uh, we, we made the same, uh, the same um, approach over other two uh, species, and uh, we calculate also the toxicity profile. Adding these two filters from for from these 25 uh, selected compounds, only three presented high binding affinities to the three uh, arginases uh, from the three species of Leishmania, and shown no uh, on toxicity profile. Uh, uh, before that, we studied the uh, the conformational uh, uh, of, of of the protein in in the acidic uh, uh, in the acidic environment so we simulated the uh, the structure in this uh, in this environment before that and we we apply molecular dynamics to see if they if if, if the target uh, and the and the and the compounds form complexes and if they are st stable under pH 2 and pH 7, and, and we observed that only two of the three of, uh, shown a stable complexes. They, they bind and they have an stable binding even in, uh, in, this, in this harsh uh, situation. So for in, in the end of the pipeline, we found that mild building is as a potential candidate. Well, we found that anthocyanins are stable at lower pH solutions. Uh, Malvinin has been uh, studied for antioxidant, antihypertensive, anti-inflammatory, anti-obesity, anti-arthritis, anti-proliferative, and anti-cancer drug candidate. And uh, the ADNET profile showed the potential for oral root administration and high viability. Bio but only malvidin results have been ratified by experimental studies published elsewhere. So, uh, the other the other molecule has no has no uh, experimental 
background. So we, for, for this reason, we consider Mavinin as, 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 as a lead of, the, of, of, of both. And, 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 and before I finish, I would like to, to show you, uh, present to you uh, the, natural, the Peru Natural Product Database Initiative, which is a, a database similar to the, uh, to the, that was employed in the, in the beginning of this work. Um, for for this uh, for the assembling of this uh, of this uh, of this database, uh, a, a bunch of paper were reviewed and and are described three thirty seven general and satisfied classified described, which which is a uh, which fifth, which ends with two two hundred eighty compounds, and we compare this. Uh, this data set with other databases from for of natural products and we see, we saw that uh, in the chemical space there were similar uh, uh, but when com when comparing their chemical di diversity beside uh, the natural our uh, peru natural product database have a smaller number of of compounds it looks it it it, it results shows that it's have the the most diverse chemical uh, in this in, in its data sets, and also that uh, it can be up, it can be employed in in virtual screening campaigns since it it shows a, a, a when compared to the FDA uh, data set uh, it it shows it have a similar profile so it, it can be the case that 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 it can be used in virtual screening campaigns. So I I am uh, ending, and I would like to again uh, uh, thanks Cambran and Marianne, and would like to thank uh, the first author of these two papers that I'm presenting, Professor uh, Haruna Barasorda, which is the the first author of, of both and uh, an associate uh, researcher in the research group that I'm leading. Uh, thanks thanks again for for hearing me. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much uh, for that, Miguel. Um, a brilliant, robust look at how you're building really that database and trying to push it forward. It'd be interesting to see the kind of questions that come up for next steps in terms of, I'm sure that from where you started with this, with the database as you've described it at the end slide, that's going to grow and grow and grow given the biodiversity that you're sitting on or you're there in Peru. So I wonder what type of partnerships are going to develop along those lines and what's needed to push that, um, this this anthrocyanin molecule, this malvadin forward, um, given how, it, how it's progressed to date so far. And I wonder from the varied audience, I mean, you mentioned Afro database, you mentioned the, the, the Nubi database, the Brazilian database at, at the beginning. And you're seeing it, it's really interesting because I just shout out to the audience you're seeing quite a uh, spread geographically of people so it kind of does reflect uh, the kind of um, the varied interest from across the world in this particular field so as a quick shout out uh, it's always good to involve the audience as well thank you very much for all attending so uh, professor Birgit Venevalt from the University of uh, Copenhagen uh, we've got uh, Dr. Sefi Atnafi from uh, Addis Ababa University on the other side in, in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, we've also got uh, Dr. Benal Kamal Edin from uh, the Institute Pasteur in Algeria. Uh, a big shout out to, to Josephine Meganjuri from the University of Embu in Kenya. Um, and then kind of uh, Owen Bicknell. Hi there, Owen, from the Mentor Initiative from Gaziantep in Turkey. The horrendous uh, earthquake had happened, and please stay safe out there, Owen, um, uh, as well. Um, Professor Mohammed Habib Jemli from the uh, Institute Pasteur in uh, Tunisia. Uh, we've got lots of different people from different kind of geographies. That's how much interest there is in this. Um, from Ghana, uh, Dr. Mante. Uh, I'm just giving a shout out to everybody just to give a feel of that kind of the, this is being looked at from across the world. Um, and these are all potential collaborators and potential partners. Uh, Dr. Maria, uh, Dr. Marja de Jong from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at Utrecht in the Netherlands. I hope it's less cold there today, Marja, than it is in London today. It's freezing. 
uh, from Tanzania, Isaac Niagama, who's looking at the, the youth involvement uh, in, um, in the youth programs uh, within Tanzania and Africa. From the USA, Professor uh, David Blake from the Fort Lewis College in Colorado. Um, from the LHSTM and CREAC uh, based in Benin, uh, Dr. Idilfonse Agoni, uh, medical entomology. Um, from Uganda, another medical entomologist, uh, Dr. Antelor Bayerhunga. Uh, we've got loads, Dr. Raf, uh, Dr. Rafa Huala, from the, uh, he's a postdoc fellow from the Institute of Pasteur in Tunis. Uh, many, many people, Lords Duque joining us from Spain, from Anisvad. Um, Dr. Professor uh, Diego Benitez from the Institute Pasteur in Montevideo in Uruguay. Um, saying it's a pleasure to participate. It's that the pleasure is ours. We're absolutely delighted that lots of different people can join. Um, Samuel uh, Negui from Kenya, uh, Claudia Asancho from the uh, from Brazil, from the Santa Casa Hospital in Brazil. Um, Dr. Ikram Guizani, she's joining us from the head of lab at the Institute Pasteur in Tunis. Uh, a lot of interest, and from Argentina, uh, Dr. Giuliano. Uh, from the University of Buenos Aires. There's a lot of a lot of interest, and that's a long list of names, but there's a lot of interest in terms of this particular uh, area, and it does reflect the kind of need that is, that, that is out there in terms of finding new structures or new candidates to push them forward. And it's kind of a neat segue into our next speaker. So thank you very much for that, Miguel, and we'll come back for the Q&A at the end. It's a neat segue simply because Fifteen years ago, uh, Professor Wasan, Professor Kishore Wasan, was one of the co-founders um, and kind of pioneer, really, uh, co and was a co-director of the Neglected uh, Global Diseases Initiative at the University of British Columbia. I say pioneer because at that time it was one of the first ever kind of uh, looks at access, bringing access issues into the development of drugs. He's smiling, but we we we, we track that and we we we've tracked that, and we're very kind of honoured that you're joining us today because it'd be interested to get your viewpoint on how these kind of molecules or what what's kind of needed. I'm not. I'm not saying we're going to come up with a roadmap, but some kind of indication. How do you take this forward? And I'm sure, given your uh, not just background, but what's happening at UBC, uh, and I'm not really I'm not just referring to oral and fed to serin B, the, the the reformulation effort, but the kind of spread of activity you've got there. I'm sure that will reflect itself quite nicely in your presentation and be interesting to get your viewpoint. One last thing for a handover is I would say to the audience, after uh, Professor Wassan's uh, presentation, there will be a Q&A. Please have your questions ready because we want you to immerse yourselves in this. As an example, Dr. Guzian, you're the head of lab and we're honored that you're joining us. And so obviously the molecular uh, based questions, I'm sure molecular biology based questions in terms of the docking, uh, screening, um, dynamics and all of that are going to come into this or any of you we, are, we absolutely want you to be asking questions to the, to the two panelists today enough from me I'm going to hand over the floor to you Kishore the floor is yours I'm going to back out well thank you very much uh, Cameron and Mariana for this wonderful invitation thank you also Miguel for your outstanding presentation and to the audience today. And I do see a breadth and depth of uh, pe people from around the world. Before I start my presentation, as Cameron and as Miguel have mentioned, um, today I'm really gonna talk about uh, some of the work we've done with Amphoterus and B. I've worked on Amphoterus and B for, for 30 years. My professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Gabe Lopez discovered AbleSet, which uh, became uh, a lipid base formulation on the market, uh, ultimately was uh, superseded by Ambisome, which is one of the main main parenteral formulations of AMP-B for treating leishmaniasis and systemic fungal infections. But a couple of key points I want to put, uh, point out before I move into my presentation. Number one, what Miguel is doing is outstanding because we actually do need new drug molecules and drug candidates to be able to treat leishmaniasis and other emerging infectious diseases. It's not just leishmaniasis, parasitic diseases, but other major diseases as well. And I think his platform sets the stage for that. Um, what I've put in the uh, chat are two key papers. One is a paper we published in Drug Discovery Today last year, which uses um, an AI algorithm 
to discover drug candidates for a number of infectious diseases, including COVID. But what we've included in there are pharmacokinetic principles, ADME principles, and formulation principles that you would need to incorporate in a drug discovery development pipeline. So even though you might have a molecular hit and you might have a drug that looks like from a molecular perspective, it's going to work, unless you have um, ideal ADME, pharmacokinetic principles, pharmacokinetic parameters, and a formulation that's tropically stable, cost-effective, easy to access, um, you're never really going to get anything onto the market, let alone into patients and developing world for developing world indications. So the Drug Discovery Today paper and our, ad, and our AI platform puts those things into uh, in, in, into place. And um, in fact, I see a major collaboration with Miguel and with many of you in taking novel molecules for leishmaniasis and being able to reformulate them or formulate them in the case of new molecules so that they're able to be given to patients and in a, a timely fashion that is cost effective, safe, and accessible. The second paper I've put in there is a recent review paper that my wife and I and our team have done on reviewing novel oral amphotericin B formulations that are currently out there and at our different stages. Many of them are for systemic fungal infections. A couple of them have moved into phase clinical trials. We are one of those groups. And I'll talk today a little bit about um, amphotericin B. But I wanna keep in mind the following. Amphotericin B, the work we're doing with amphotericin B, though very important, and we think we have an important player in one of the formulations that we could use or novel drug delivery systems we could use to help treat leishmaniasis, the formulation strategy could be applied to other drugs as well. So even though I'm gonna talk about amphotericin B, please look at that as a case to other, as other examples. So this next slide is really talks about the global access principles at, at the University of British Columbia. So as Cameron mentioned, UBC was one of the first schools in Canada and maybe one of the first around the world that have global access principles. And what these principles are that adderable for certain technologies that are for developing world indications at or below costs, we will develop them at or below costs for those indications. We're not trying to make money. We're not trying to commercialize. We're just simply trying to get these technologies to help people on the ground. And I mean, you'll be able to see these slides later on, so I won't go through all the different parts of the principles, but that's one of the main things we're trying to do. We have a, we have a, had a very thriving university allied for essential medicine chapter. We were one of the best in, in the world. And the UAEM uh, report card on global access ranked UBC as number one around the globe in 2013. And I think again in 2017, we were close to number one before our global access work. So let's jump into amphotericin B. Miguel talked a little bit about this drug, but I'm gonna deep dive, uh, do a deeper dive and kind of give you an understanding about this drug. So this drug is a Pauline macrolid antibiotic used in the treatment of bloodborne fungal infections and parasitic infections like leishmaniasis. However, it has dose-dependent nephrotoxicity. It's poorly water soluble. It has very low bioavailability. You have to give it as an IV infusion over a period of time. And IV infusions themselves have, have toxicities. You get red blood cell hemolysis. Patients have shivers and chiggers and, and shake when you give this IV infusion. And amphotericin, liposomal amphotericin B is not as accessible. I mean, people have to come to a hospital or a medical clinic with a trained personnel to get the medication, and it is not tropically stable in terms of a formulation. So there are some major issues with amphotericin B, though it is a very effective drug in the treatment of leishmaniasis, very little resistance to, to the different forms of leash. There has been some uh, spotty clinical reports, but they're really one-offs for the most part. It actually, there is not much resistance to amphotericin B. Now, amphotericin B's mechanism of action is critical and it's very important. This is a paper I published with Dr. Scott Hartzell at Wisconsin almost 20 years ago now, talking about the importance of amphotericin B as a drug and its mechanism of action. So amphotericin B is, a, is in a monomer firm form is really a, a, a membrane binder. And what it does is it binds to the, the sterile component of cells. So that's ergosterol in fungal and parasitic cells, and that's uh, cholesterol and mammalian cells. And what ends up happening is this monomeric form will bind into the uh, bind into the pocket of the sterol and cause pores and channels and lyse the cell membrane and kill the cell. You have to be in the monomer form 
for it to be active. And this is actually quite important, which I'll discuss in a few moments with our formulation. So this slide is a very important slide. What we discovered a number of years ago, and actually was discovered with the liposomal formulations of AMP-B, is that when you package your amphotericin B into a formulation, when it comes to within the vicinity of a fungal cell or a parasitic cell, these cells secrete phospholipases. And these phospholipases actually cleave the amphotericin B away from their, their drug delivery package in a monomeric form. And in the monomeric form, it can be very effective in forming these porn formations in the cell membrane and causing toxicity. However, if the drug stays in a, in, in a complex form, not in a monomeric form, it can't be active. And that's very important in the selective activity of amphotericin B. Uh, this is a slide showing you that this has a wide range of efficacy, not only for Leishmaniasis, what we're going to talk about today, but for many other fungal infections. One of the big ones, of course, is cryptococcal meningitis, particularly in HIV patients. Candidiasis has now become a big issue. As you know, there has been co-infections with, with, with fungal infections and, and COVID-19 and COVID, and that's been a big issue. And as you know, there was a major shortage of amphotericin B in my, in my home country of India. Uh, well, over the last couple of years because they were scrambling to deal with both black fungus and COVID at the same time. So amphotericin B is still a mainstay drug and the formulations are extremely important. But the problem is it's the shortage of these formulations, the lack of accessibility, their cost effectiveness and so on. And that's a bit of a major problem. Well, as Miguel talked about, um, he gave you the current state of leishmaniasis. You know, this data is always out of date. You know, surveillance and knowing what's going on with leishmaniasis has changed over a number of years. I think Miguel's uh, figures on what the WHO has reported, I think, is a much more accurate of understanding and appreciation of leishmaniasis. Climate change has played a big role. Um, we're now seeing leishmaniasis in the southern United States. We're seeing leishmaniasis in places in the world where the sand fly can habitat and, and flourish, and this is becoming a major problem. So even though I give you some numbers here, I think it's really underreported, and it's still a major, major issue. And this is, again, a, a, a figure uh, similar to Miguel's showing where we're seeing in endemic countries, and it's actually spreading much more than what I even show here. So what are the current treatments? You know, it's really funny. I've been in this, I've been in this business for 25 years and um, I took a few years away from, from this work as I was doing administrative duties. And when I got back into this field just before the pandemic in 2018, 2019, I was, I was hoping that there would have been a significant advancement in new molecules in drug development and formulation development for leishmaniasis. And there have been some significant uh, uh, really movement forward, particularly in diagnostics and in surveillance. But to my surprise, there really hasn't been many new molecules and novel molecules or strategies to deal with leishmaniasis, particularly in a pragmatic, practical way. There didn't seem to be um, new things that have come to the horizon. There has been some recent outstanding work done by DNDI, WHO, and others looking at combination therapy of miltefacine and paramomycin, particularly in East Africa. And I would re recommend you to look at a paper in Clinical Infectious Diseases talking about some exciting results that they have doing that combination in treating people in East Africa. But the limitations of the therapies and the accessibility of the therapies still seems to be lacking. So here in this slide, I show you the following. Liposomal amphotericin is very effective and very safe for the most part, but it has infusion, infusion toxicity problems. And even though costs have come down, it's still not as cost effective as it could be. Metafacine is an outstanding drug. It is the only oral form, only oral drug for the treatment of, of visceral leishmaniasis, but it has a number of issues. It has drug resistance problems. It has issues with uh, toxicity. Uh, particularly in women in childbearing age, um, and it, it, it is not tropically stable. And so there are issues with miltefacine. And paramomycin is a classic aminoglycoside, and aminoglycosides do have toxicity issues. You have to give, you have to give very painful intramuscular injections would make it very not accessible to patients. And even though the frequency of paramomycin injections have gone down significantly from the CID study that DNDI did, it's still an issue. So how do we overcome these pragmatic barriers? 
Um, and that is something that needs to be discussed. So a parental administration in itself, giving an IV infusion, has limitations. It's a loss of income. It's an increased cost of administration. It's an increased risk of side effects. It's a decreased availability of treatment. And particularly, many of the people that have the disease are unfortunately women, women of childbearing age, children that are in rural communities. So accessibility of getting the medication and being able to be treated on a regular basis is a real problem and continues to be a real problem. So when we were working on oral amphotericin B, it was actually a serendipitous story. I, was, I had worked on amphotericin B for many years uh, in my professor's lab at MD Anderson. And when I, came to, when I came to UBC back in the late 90s, I was giving brown rounds at Vancouver General Hospital. And we were talking about combination therapy of caspal fungin and amphotericin B for fungal infections and for patients that were going to be in transplantation patients that were going to need immunotherapy plus before transplantation that would be susceptible for fungal infections. And one of the physicians, ID doctors in the back said, can you, Quiche, come up with an oral formulation of amphotericin B to treat or as a prophylactic therapy for patients that have potential systemic fungal infections secondary to transplantation. And I didn't think it was possible. I didn't think the molecule could be reformulated. As Miguel mentioned, there were a number of limitations with this molecule. But I went back to the lab. We were working on oral lipids for drug delivery of other, of other um, uh, molecules. And to make a long story short, we came up with a first generation formulation that we thought we wanted to test out. We got some really exciting preliminary data in our fungal models. Um, I got my wife involved. My wife is a formulation scientist at the University of Saskatchewan, does amazing research in this area. And we had some first generation results with our oral formulation for fungal infections. And then we garnered the attention of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We went to Seattle, we gave a presentation there. And long story short, they partnered us and supported our work through their consortium for parasitic drug development. And they had an ideal model for leishmaniasis. So here what I'm showing you is the model itself. So these are mice that are infected with 1 times 10 to the 7th leishmaniasis donovi. Their treatment begins seven days post-infection, so it gives time for the leash to seed primarily in the liver and the spleen. Then what we did is we gave oral ampi, our formulation, administered BID for five consecutive days. The mice were sacrificed on day 14, and livers were weighed, and impression smears were made. A number of Leishmaniasis mastigotes per liver nuclei, cell nuclei were determined. And the nice thing about this work is that we made the formulation, we standardized the formulation, we tested it in our fungal models, we did the tropical stability studies in our lab, but then we shipped it to Ohio State University where this model was that was funded by the Parasitic Drug Development Group and Gates Foundation, and they did the testing. So you know, in science, it's important that you have an independent lab test your, test your work. And the results really blew us away. So on the y-axis here is the LD, is the Leishmaniasis donovi. On the x-axis are a number of treatment groups. So the first one is the uncontrolled, the uncontrolled group. So this is the leash, the amount of leash that's in the liver. The second is our vehicle control. So this is our oral formulation without the amphotericin B. Miltefacine was our positive, oral positive control. We gave three migs per kg, PO, QD, times five days. And you saw about a 50% reduction in the leishmaniasis. Ambisome, which is the liposomal formulation of MP, the positive control to show that this was not, that this is a very active model and mimics what you see in the clinic. And you can see that ambisome was very effective. But here's the exciting part. We called it ICO-009. Um, our formulation and 10 and 20 milligrams per kilogram PO for five days almost, almost completely eradicated the, the, the leishmaniasis. And there was no toxicity associated with it. And this was extremely exciting to us. We did this then, then in a dose response. Um, and so this is a repeat of the study again, but at different doses. And you can see there was a dose response effect and a reduction. By the way, this work was published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, as well as PLOS NTD a um, number of years ago. Um, and this really set the stage for what we, what we were getting with this model. By the way, we also did this work in Leishmaniasis in hamsters. So we wanted to make sure this was not a function, just one animal model, and we found similar results there. So this was very exciting preliminary results and very important to us. 
What was also important is that people need to understand the pharmacokinetics and the tissue distribution of amphotericin B. And what people don't realize or understand about this particular molecule is that amphotericin B really, it's not about blood levels. It's about tissue concentrations at a high enough tissue concentration as a function of time to treat the diseases that are in those tissues. So systemic fungal infections are found in the liver, spleen, kidney, and lung. Uh, Leishmaniasis, as you know, is primarily in the liver and the spleen. So it was important to do a biodistribution to determine where our formulation was going. And the bottom line is, is that we were having high enough concentrations of amphotericin B being absorbed into the tissues where the, tox where, where the infection was occurring so that a, there was enough to have pharmacologic effect but not have toxicity. And that's what's really important here. So here we're showing you the biodistribution of our formulation at different doses, at different dosing regimens, and how much is going in each of the tissues. And we compared it to an IV. And even though, you know, you're never going to be right up to an IV. I mean, it's, you know, you've always got bioavailability differences, but we have more than enough getting into the tissues to have pharmacologic effect. The other big thing that was really important is toxicity. So you have great efficacy with oral amphotericin B, but we had to make sure that it wasn't toxic at the doses that we were using. And so therefore, what we show you here is some histopathology, which shows that our oral formulation in the, in the kidney, the liver, and the jejunum do not have any toxicity, not any damage. Why the IV infusion of fungisome, which we use as the micellular control, you can see that there is necrosis and damage um, in the liver and in the kidney showing that our formulation was safe. We also did um, serum creatinine for the kidney. We also did biomarkers in the liver, as well as histopathology, and showed that at the doses and at the dosing regimen that we were working with, we, showed, we did not see toxicity, yet we saw significant efficacy. This is, this is a poster that we pu published and presented um, uh, a little while ago. Um, and it's hard to read this on the slide, so you can look at it later. But what we're showing you is the Gates Foundation said, OK, you've got a great formulation, but we need a tropically stable formulation. So we went back into the lab. We, we revised our formulation, made it tropically stable. We tested it all right, to make sure that it was tropically stable. And that's what these, gra these graphs show here, that the formulation stays intact and and it doesn't fall apart and amphotericin b as the molecule doesn't fall apart at 30 to 43 degrees over 120 days at high humidity conditions um, and we don't change the particle size or the formulation itself and so on and then we tested it in our and this in the vl model that they have at ohio state university and we saw similar results in the reduction in the uh, leishmaniasis load in the liver so now we had a tropically stable formulation that when we tested in our animal models was very effective against leash without the toxicity. So the next step was to go to the clinic. And what we have done now is fa human phase 1A and phase 1B clinical studies. These are healthy human beings, patients, men and women between the ages of 18 to 60 that were given either single dose of oral amphotericin B um, at one single dose up to 800 milligrams, or they were given multiple dose, 400 milligrams a day for 10 consecutive days. And then we measured to see not only if there was any toxicity or what did we have in terms of blood levels and sustainable, sustained systemic exposure. And again, it's very hard to read this in this poster, but you can blow it up and look at it yourself. We've actually published this paper um, in Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy in 2020, and I put the citation in the chat for you. But the bottom line is we didn't see any renal tox. We did not see any liver tox. We didn't see any muscle issues. Didn't see any GI toxicity. And what was really important is we had a sustained blood level of amphotericin B. That's what this, this graph here says, over 24 to 48 hours. It's really about AUC, systemic exposure, as opposed to blood level. And what's really nice about our formulation is that you see still blood in the uh, drug in the bloodstream over 48 hours. Now that's really important because what's happening is is that we're able to get this as a depot effect into the tissues and staying into the tissues so it has pharmacologic effect. And that can be really important in terms of, of prophylactic use, chronic use, et cetera, and it's at non-toxic doses. 
The other thing that's really exciting about this is that our formulation, the AMPI only gets re released in the monomeric form. Remember I showed you that data, that the AMPI has to be in the monomeric form in order to be effective. So it only gets released at the site of infection because of the in the monomeric form, because phospholipases get released, cleave the amphotericin B away from its package, and it kills the, the parasitic cell. Why, in terms of normal kidney cells or liver cells, there are no phospholipases that are released. The amphotericin B stays packaged with the formulation, cannot cause any toxicity. So what do we have here? We have a propriety blend of mono and diglycerides that are FDA approved. They've got grass approval. They're affordable lipid excipients. We're talking about pennies a day for patients. They're easy to scale up. We have formulation stability out to 120 days. We have drug stability at 43 degrees for 120 days. So you do not need a cold train and you can get it to people. You can get it accessible to people. It's a cost effective, safe, tropically stable, an accessible formulation that overcomes the current barriers of the current medications that we have for patients. And that's why um, we're talking a known drug, and yes, it's repurposed, but the repurposing had a strategy. The strategy was to overcome those pragmatic barriers that other formulations, other drugs, other, other things we had. So this is a game changer in our opinion that can be another player, another tool for people, for clinicians, physicians, public health uh, uh, groups, et cetera, on the ground for patients. And you could give it prophylactically. You could give it to people who may be susceptible to being stung by the sand fly so that they may not get this disease. So the bottom line is here's the advantages, as I mentioned. It's affordable, easy to store, easy to administer, lack of kidney tox, lack of infusion-related toxicities. You don't have to give an IV infusion. This is given orally, and lack of liver and GI toxicity as well. The good news is that it, it can also be used with patients in drug-resisting strains, and we would be one of the first available fungicidal agents on the market. This is not static, a fungal static agent, all right? It doesn't just uh, prevent for the growth, it kills existing as well. We got received orphan drug designation from the FDA. We've got a number of patents that have been issued, and I already mentioned the positive human results. So I leave you with this last slide in that what is the opportunities to increase accessibility? In that on the left-hand side, we talk about the issues with parenteral amphotericin B and any parental medication for that, for that matter. There's a loss of income due to hospitalization for IV therapy. People have to go into the hospital. They can't work at home. They can't work in their communities. We have an easy to administer home administration. There's a high cost of administration. We decrease that cost. There's a risk of infusion related side effects. We don't have an infusion issue because we're giving it orally. There's a risk of systemic toxicities. We don't have that toxicity. There's a limited accessibility because again, you have to have trained human personnel uh, uh, medical personnel, they have to give an IV infusion, they have to be in a medical clinic. Um, we don't have that. You can actually take it to the people out in the communities and they can take, they can self administer it to themselves on the ground. And finally, the current formulations of liposomal AMPI are not heat stable, while we have a thermally stable formulation. So I want to thank you very much for the time. But again, I want also to let you know about the big picture. And the big picture here is here's a strategy of taking an old drug, reformulating it to address the limitations of, of therapy for the old drug, and then getting it out there. We can use this strategy for other drugs and vaccines. In fact, my wife and I are doing vaccine research for pertussis and, and influenza, where we're doing similar strategy. There's a number of different projects with new drug molecules for drug-resistant tuberculosis and other diseases at the University of British Columbia and NGDI. And this is where I think partnerships with people like Miguel, with people who are on the, who have got molecules that are maybe on this presentation could be very helpful. So again, thank you very much. And I look forward to the Q&A and the chat. Thank you very, very much, uh, Kishore, there for a wonderful presentation. And thank you very, very much, Miguel, as well. Um, getting a lot of uh, kind of put in from the um, lovely audience as well, from uh, Dr. Giuliano, from the uh, University of Buenos Aires. Uh, thank you, Miguel, for a wonderful presentation. Some questions from Sophie Owen, uh, from Dr. Zawidi from Ethiopia. 
um, asking, uh, and Dr. Adeen is asking about the costs of the new formulation and new So we'll, we'll come to those questions, and I really appreciate that. Edibil Al Bizar had mentioned that, in reference to the AMP B, binding to ergosterol is only one of the mechanisms of action. So there's a lot of uh, kind of um, questions and, and uh, comments coming through. I, and I can address those questions well, if you like. Just let me well, know when you're ready. Yeah, well, and we, we'll, we'll, we'll bring these into the, the, the Q&A. Um, and so, so we'll definitely do that. And I would say to the audience, thank you for that. And please feel free to, to, to this is about you. We want you to interact. Both presentations have really shown the potential of, of partnership and what's possible um, potentially uh, in terms of bringing a molecule through these processes to market fully schmalices. And I think there's so much there that we should kind of uh, perhaps frame this conversation in that kind of light in terms of potential partnerships. On that basis, the kind of first question I'm going to put to Miguel, um, thank you as, as many of the other uh, attendees are saying for a wonderful presentation. Um, you talked about the, the, the um, virtual, the in silico approaches that we're using, the molecular docking, the uh, molecular dynamics, the virtual screening. I, I suppose I wanted to ask you, um, really, uh, what were the kind of main problems when you applied this type of analysis, the in silico approaches, to specifically to, to leishmaniasis? Well, they are they are uh, they are called neglected. No, not only for for founding, but for information mainly. Uh, th this is this is the main problem. Most of the tools are are are, are designed for for humans, not and and, and there are some uh, few uh, information about this type of disease. For example, most of the genome is un uh, uncharacterized. You you have you you know that there is. That, that there is a pro that there is a gene that encodes a protein, but you don't have any idea of what that gene that protein does. That mm -hmm. has no name. It's uncharacterized. So this is one one of the, the problems. We have worked with hypothetical proteins too, because they they tend to be uh, very different from humans. So if they if you aim it at, as a target. As a, as, a, as a target, you you may have no issues with with toxicity because this is an, a unique uh, uh, protein from for, for for the for the parasite. So this is one of the the, 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 the information and and tool development. This is is probably the the, the the main problem for for applying in silico or bioinformatics in in this type of disease. Oh, brilliant. That's a great answer. And I'm sure some of the um, the audience will have some uh, input into that. Dr. Sefe Tanafi from the Addis Ababa, he's asking, you use natural database from Brazil. Is it possible to include the plant species that have a traditional claim from Peru um, without a wellness, without this information that, that you're mentioning? Can you include... Um, the species that have, let's say, uh, traditional medicine settings already being used in Peru, uh, but without the kind of real robust information around them, anecdotal evidence, can they be used in this or not? Yes. Well, we we are uh, we built the first version of the of the of the of the Peru any uh, database. So most of the others uh, database are are in their third, third or fourth version. It's just a, it's just the beginning. We we are going to add information. Uh, this is an an unfounded uh, initiative. So it's like <laughs> it's like yeah. we are we were uh, working very hard for this because there is no no much information about natural products from Peru. We we know that there's an ethnopharmacological employment of some of these uh, some of these plants, but we don't know exactly what what that what molecule and what that molecule really does. So it's that's the type of information that we are going to we are we are able to work and to fulfill this 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 gap of information. Sometimes. So. I was, just, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm sure that's very inspiring to people like Dr. Atnafi uh, as an example, simply because there's a lot of parallels between the biodiversity in Peru and the kind of the use of herbal medicine, the use of 
uh, this type of approach in, let's say, African settings or other communities. I'm sure this would be inspirational to, you know, you produce a tool such as this kind of um, this uh, database and get that off the ground in those settings as well. So hopefully you guys can start talking with each other or, or start some dialogue on that basis. I'm sure there's lots of lessons to be learned on both sides. Coming to the, the output from your work, in terms of this anthro um the, the, the malvadin, uh, you found it was stable at low pHs, so there's quite a lot of promise there in leishman anti leishman um activity. What's your, what are your next kind of steps on that? What are your plans? I'm sure you're not just going to leave it as it is. How, how, what, 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 what's the ideal next steps for you? What are the kind of roads of partnership available around that? Ah, for sure. We we are going to 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 seek to validate them in 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 vitro or, or, and in vivo animal models. So, for for a first step, let's see how it it, it behaves in in a in an animal model in, in mice and hamsters. Like 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 these these are the the most wide uh, model animal models employed in in visceral analysis. It, it may be the case that we can test it for for cutaneous lesmanages too against uh, I have the I have the expertise with uh, and a collaborator has the expertise with the Leishmania amazonensis species that there is a debate that it causes or, or it not causes both types of disease so mm. we are ahead to to test it uh, in, in animal and in, in vitro and then in animal model as a first step of validation. That's fantastic. Let's say post, and I'm sure some of the audience here, there might be, I'll keep saying this, because this is really is about bringing everybody together. There might be potential partners here that could help drive that forward. And if there are, please, you know, feel free to put a question in or a comment in. I'm sure it'd be well received. Um, in terms of this, um, so, that, that's one of the, the issues moving it through the pipeline. I was going to bring Professor uh, Wassan into it because you did mention at the beginning of your uh, particular talk the, the kind of uh, the, the use of artificial intelligence for the discovery in your settings of novel antimicrobials. But I think you did say that this could be used across different diseases or, or certainly for novel molecules. How would you view driving? I'm just using the example of Malvadin because that's one, something that's come out of Miguel's work. I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of other compounds coming through. What are your views on driving that using this AI approach that you've, you've got there? Yeah, sure. so yeah, so thank you very much. Um, you know, here's the thing is that hundreds of millions of dollars are spent uh, with high throughput screening and basically hypothesis driven research, trying to find new novel drugs um, and molecules and to be able to, to treat many em emerging infectious diseases. Um, you know, there was a huge push around COVID-19, for instance, and of course, subsequently what we know what's happening there. Um, but the big problem is, is that um, we need to do uh, more intelligence, uh, intelligence type of, of process where uh, informed decision making process, where what we can do is we can use artificial intelligence to help us predict what novel molecules not only would have the best affinity for binding to, the, to a specific molecular target, but would have optimal adsorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, so ADME, pharmacokinetic principles, and could be easily formulated into a tapsel, capsule or a tablet or whatever that could be easily scaled up to give to patients. And so the artificial intelligence that many people are using, we are using this, we've developed it actually with colleagues at Louisiana State University, um, not only looks at not, I mean, millions of compounds and databases to determine to target a molecular target, just like uh, Miguel has done with leishmaniasis, um, but then determine from there which of those compounds would have the ADME principles, pharmacokinetic principles, and would be easily formulated that could become a product. And then those are selected for animal testing, for specific animal testing, then which would ultimately go at the development mm. chain. So that will save us multi millions of dollars and hopefully get us greater success 
And I think that this is where we're going in drug development and discovery. Big Pharma is already doing this. Uh, I have a lot of former graduate students who work in Big Pharma, and many of them, they use their own algorithms like that right now. There are simu computer simulated modeling that's going on. There's a, there's a thing called pharmacometrics. So pharmacometrics is using physiologically based pharmacokinetics and simulating how a drug will behave in the body on the computer and before moving it into key animal studies. So I think, uh, Cameron, there's a lot there that we can build on. Yeah. And this could lead to really efficient, effective ways of getting lead molecules and in a, in a timely fashion, because one of the problems right now, it takes years to get, mm -hmm. to, to get something to a point where we're treating, we're treating patients. Yeah. Even our repurposing strategy for amphotericin B, because we had to repurpose it in a new novel formulation and change the route of administration, it has taken us 15 years just to get to finish phase one clinical trials. And that's with a yeah. drug that everybody knows about that's been around since the, 19, since the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. What happens when you're dealing with a brand new drug, all right, a new novel molecule, you're gonna to have to do all that testing, toxicity testing, kinetic testing, genotoxicity, et cetera, before you yeah. can move it forward. So, so that's I, where AI plays a big role. Yeah, that's brilliant. And thank you very much for that answer. That, that's a great answer, a very encouraging answer. Just bringing that back to Miguel for a second. I mean, do you feel that's a capacity issue from a Peruvian perspective? I mean, you know, or do you think it is you're gonna to get to that route through partnerships out of Peru? Because oh no, the, the testing is going to be done in Brazil. Yeah. Um, here we have we, we have few scientists, in, and that's a main issue. We need uh, we need trained people to perform science. So we have a a, 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 a very few uh, that work with in the field. I think I, I was talking with a, a Peruvian a postdoctoral fellow in 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 Italy and uh, she was she was uh, thinking in, in come back and work here and I told her that that if you do if you do that you are going to be the only the only uh, medicinal chemistry here in Peru and to, and you are too young for that mm. so we need scientists we need scientists That's, so, I mean, yeah we need scientists yeah. that's I a mean, big I'm... problem and we, and we totally get that. I mean, just building on that, what other kind of problems, I guess, problems or obstacles in terms of developing new drug candidates for leash do you foresee, Miguel? And I'm talking about from a Peruvian or perhaps wider Latin American perspective, what other obstacles apart from the white scientists? We've mentioned tools for the development of that, adding these new kind of AI technologies and moving things forward, or as capacity issue at scientist level. Are there other obstacles that you foresee? Your your honest opinion? For sure, funding. No. There is a there is a, a a problem with funding. We the agencies here in in, in Latin America are they have they they don't allow some some types of of of, of science to 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 roll out, you know, mm. you you have times and they have a, a very strict uh, timelines, and you have to to in, 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 and in science always there is no there is no straight. Line. You may you may have a a backlash and then come back with another with another solution. So that's funding, that's, yeah. 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 yeah, the the big F word that everyone's going to talk Yeah, and I, I totally hear you. It's an honest answer. Um, and hopefully that environment will change uh, moving forward, given that you've got so much potential in terms of the various candidate structures that you're going to be finding or putting forward. So I do hope that does change or you're able to change that situation. Um, I said that's a great answer. Thank you for that. And again, I would ask the audience if you have the question. I'm going to bring some of these questions in, but some of these questions are more towards the uh, for, for Kishore. So I want to move to Kishore for a second, if, if that's okay. Um, you you talked a lot about in terms of getting the uh, addressing the kind of the the pragmatic issues as you put them, the thermal stability, the access issues, the cost effectiveness, the safety issues, the toxicity issues, um, and. Uh, 
one of the issues of the cost effect, Dr. Benal uh, Kamal Edin, he's asking, what is the cost of this new formulation? It's a bit of a killer question. What was well, the actually, the yeah. So um, I, I can address. I've actually put the answers to the questions in the chat already. But um, you know, we're working with very, we're working with lipid excipients that are really cheap and that are grass approved. And so we've cost out the actual cost at around a dollar a day Canadian. Um, it's very, very cheap. Again, because of our global access principles at the University of British Columbia, um, we are not trying to make profit here. We are trying to do just cost, cost recovery in terms of formulation scale up and manufacturing costs. So it, it is relatively cheap. Uh, we have done a pharmacoeconomic analysis so that you know we try to make it as cheap as possible um but we're looking at about a dollar a dollar a day a dollar a day brilliant uh, that's, that's a great answer i hope that answers your question dr edine um thank you for that sophie owen dr sophie owen uh from the uh, quite a success story the, the company mologic uh there she's asking in terms of this you mentioned the, the phase 1a and 1b positive data that you'd had She's she's asking really uh, in terms of are you moving into phase two and phase three clinical trials? Well, abs absolutely. We would love to. We we want to do phase two and phase three. Um, uh, I know Dr. Shannon Sundar at Bihar uh, for a very long time, and of course he's a world leader on visceral ischemiasis. And uh, um, if we can get the dollars, he's more than happy to help accommodate us with studies in the Bihar region. I have written for several grants for several foundations, but exactly to Miguel's point, it is very difficult to get funding for for phase two, phase three clinical trials. People are, you know, it's a benefit risk analysis, right? People are, are willing, um, well, let's, let me break this up into two categories. There's phase two and then there's phase three. And we're kind of in this really weird position in that we've already got very positive phase one results. So we know it's safe at the doses and dosing regimen we want to do in phase two. We've got very strong preclinical data. We feel we've got enough sustain, a sustained exposure of the drug that it'll be effective. Nobody wants to go and, give, and do a phase two with us because they're worried about the risks. And understandably, you're dealing with a, a very difficult disease here. But yet, everyone says if I have very positive phase two results, they will fund a phase three, but they want us to fund a phase two, but they won't fund a phase two because they're worried about the benefit risk analysis. So we're caught in that classic valley in the middle, and we need somebody willing to work with us so we could do a phase two um, and take a shot. And then if it's positive, then I think there is going to be no problem getting funding for phase three because um, everyone will see the, you know, the efficacy data in phase two. So um, we definitely want to do, we definitely want to do it. Um, and we're looking for support and help and any suggestions would be, would be wonderful. I, as I said, I've written for some foundation grants and I've got, and I've got feelers out there everywhere. It seems to be, my coexistence these days. But as Miguel says, you know, we're scientists and clinical scientists. We're not funders, fundraisers. And, and uh, that's where we need collaborations and help and yeah. so on and so forth. I mean, I'm, ad I'm addressing that point. Um, do you, you know, putting forward a compelling case, addressing this funding shortfall, perhaps even the capacity shortfall, um, and combining it with something that Dr. Sefe Atnafi had, had hinted, hinted to in terms of uh, these natural plant databases or, or you know, uh, th these types of databases. Is it time to pool resources at all levels? So let's say at the database level, so you pool resources of natural products from different regions uh, together to form one entity that can then be used as a compelling kind of argument to a funder that look what we have, the depth and breadth. What do you use on that, Miguel? Well, we are, we are already doing that. Sure. Uh, we have yeah. an, 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 uh, an initiative to, 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 to make the Latin American Natural Product Database yeah. Well, we have uh, we have only three online right now: um, the Mexico's one, the Brazilian one, and, and, and now Peru. And we are we are ahead to 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 Colombia's one, and I think it's El Salvador too. But most of the of the initiative is, is to to bring 
uh, know how uh, how to build that because it's not easy. <laughs> it, it it takes time. Yeah. Most of the mo most of the of the compounds are, are not able in in, in Popchem or or Bank or Chem Spider. The, the, I think in in the Peru's one we had uh, uh, almost fifty that were not uh, in, in any data bank. So we got we got to to perform the curation uh, work and see uh, any any mistake in the, in the structure. So so we are ahead of that in Latin yeah. America. I mean, that's interesting that you've you've pulled a regional resource, the Latin American region together, and you've mentioned these countries. And certainly that the PLOS paper that came out that, that Kishore had mentioned had so many researchers from the from Colombia, from the University of Cali and different countries across Latin America in terms of continuous leishmaniasis treatment, therapeutic outcomes. The paper in PLOS that came out, I think it was January earlier this year. So there's already a kind of pooling of uh, activity. But I wonder if there's a case to be made, given that uh, Dr. Atnafi from uh, Ethiopia, uh, there's, we have Professor Tal Balagi from Iran is asking if Middle East, uh, as Ir a country like Iran, uh, where leishmaniasis is very big, uh, will will will, will um, therapies and, and this kind of thing be available there? We've got you know interest from right across the kind of uh, world. Um, is it time to enhance and make a global database, not just regional, to address the capacity issue and bring in these anecdotal um, you know set uh, you know uh, information data sets around the use of various natural products uh, in this setting well, what are your views on that you already done it in latin america is there a view for a more global uh, approach to it oh for sure there are there are uh, huge data banks for for natural products but there is a, a limitation because um in, in some countries like Peru, most of the of the of the of the, the stuff remain unpublished. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the studies, uh, there are no no related. You are you are going to find some some studies in a paper. Yeah. Um, for example, there are many many papers published in Spanish uh, that we had to to overcome because we didn't uh, uh, allow ourselves to put them. Into the data, into the database, because it can be uh, achieved by, by by a worldwide audience. Yeah. So that's a, that's a second part of the of the curation of the of the version two of the, of the database that to, to try to put that that are in in a Spanish paper that are in thesis that 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 didn't publish in English to 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 pull that. Into a, the database and and curate all the all, all, all the information. Mm. So uh, it, it it may be the case that in in other countries have the same problem. Yeah, oh, that's a that's a very interesting answer actually and a very uh, pragmatic answer. And I hope that gets addressed at some level or another to move this forward. Um, there certainly looks like there's a well, there's beyond a need. There's certainly a desire for it uh, for this. Um, so that's very interesting. We've got a question here, just slightly away now to, 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 to Professor Wassan, and that's from Professor Majid Fashi Harandi from Iran. Uh, many thanks for the nice talk. Is chemotherapy of dogs, as this is a general question, is, is more from a veterinary kind of perspective, is chemotherapy of dogs as the reservoir hosts with the compounds available an option for visceral leishmaniasis control? Well, I, I, the... Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, okay, so a couple of things. Uh, uh, first of all, someone's asking in the Middle East, as Iran is, Shemaniah is big, will it be available there? Um, I'm country agnostic. I want to help the world. So, you know, uh, if we can help people around the world with Shemaniah, uh, we should. Uh, we need to build networks and relationships in the different countries because different regulatory uh, restrictions come up in each of the countries. But yes, absolutely. Um, I like to see this worldwide. We maybe need a Lishmaniasis world network of some sort. I know they're regional networks, but I'm not sure about that. The issue around chemotherapy in dogs as a reservoir, you know, I am a big proponent of One Health. And One Health, as you know, uh, is a huge, a huge um, discipline, which is the relationship between animals and humans in terms of healthcare and reservoirs that go back and forth 
I think are really important um, uh, is uh, is really, really quite important. We were approached by Brazilians a number of years ago to use oral amphotericin and be in the treatment of dogs with leishmaniasis. Um, we were too early on in that work to be ready at that time to do that. But yes, we would love to do it. We actually have um, uh, GLP toxicology and pharmacokinetic data in dogs with our oral formulation. We published this work in 2020 in antimicrobial agents and chemotherapy. And it was very, and we have very good results there. So I think we could see using oral amphotericin B in the treatment of of, of uh, dogs with leishmaniasis. However, there have been some recent reports from the WHO saying, unlike we see in humans, where we don't see any resistance um, with amphotericin B for treatment of leash, there have been reports that amphotericin B is not effective in some forms of leash in dogs. Um, and exactly the mechanisms why are still being debated. So we have to be we have to be careful there because now there seems to be, and this is specific to animals versus humans. Uh, and in fact, we just wrote a review paper that I've put in the chat uh, where we reviewed um, a review of novel oral amphotericin B formulations for the treatment of parasitic infections. Um, we just published this late last year. And in that article, we have a section about using oral amp B in the treatment of leishmaniasis in dogs. And that's where we learned about that it may not be very effective in all, in, in all certain cases that there is unfortunately some resistance. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, but yes, um, working in animal reservoirs um, is an important aspect to, to therapy. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I yeah, have of course, of course, because... well, of course, I was just about to pass it to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because it, 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 it happened that I'm a veterinarian, so <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I, I kind of know some, something in, in that in that yeah. in that field. In Brazil, uh, they 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 are using miltefosin for treatment of leishmaniasis because it's a it's a huge ethical problem. They 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 have the, the this health uh, politics that once the animal is 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 diagnosed. Diagnosis with visceral leishmaniasis is it's it it gotta be killed. So mm -hmm. in, in some sense, make some sense, but there is an ethical because there are thousands of animals killed by year. So uh, there has been a research in in in, in Brazil in, in in that in that in that in that issue. So. At least, at, 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 at least, I don't have a, any a, any notice of being a, effective any any drug. That's even mitefosin, even mitefosin has is is being a, some is 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 reporting some problems yeah. in white use. I mean, yeah, fantastic. Dr. Edu Biel Alpizar is also making the point that their dogs are treated with, as you mentioned, amphetis serotonin, but also with other anti leishmaniasis as well. Uh, he's mentioned that point as well. Um, and there's a question, uh, he's also made a few other points actually in here as well, um, which we'll come to in a second. Um, and there's no need to apologize for your Dr. Giuliano, you've written something here, he's asking Dr. Havers, have you investigated if there are some databases in Argentina, for example, in, in the disciplines of pharmacy, in the faculties of pharmacy and biochemistry? Have you looked at any Argentinian databases? Well, the, the, the Latin American uh, initiative counts with an Argentinian uh, research group, but they don't have the, they don't have online. You know, they have a, 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 a an in-house um, type of of, of, of of data set compound of com compounds, mm -hmm. but this is not a, a curated database. You don't okay. have the the, the 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 online. You can you can go to to, to a website and, and search for the for the for the compounds as as Brazil, Mexico, and Peru have. Uh, well, they have a, a, a data set that is I think is available. Uh, as uh, if you if you ask so, but uh, the, the availability or the free availability makes a difference in, in that sense. Yeah, I mean, can I, I um, can I jump in, uh, Cameron, just for a couple of things quickly? Uh, my apologies, um, because there's a lot of debate on in the chat, which is excellent. Um, uh, 
absolutely one of the comments was made that you can't extrapolate what happens in animals to what happens in humans that's that that's true of course we use animal models to model what might happen in humans but physiologically there are differences for instance hamsters have multiple stomachs and and that could be different in how we treat a hamster versus we treat a human being cows have nine stomachs for instance um but you know so that's true though we use animal models as models and that's why they are models to help us give some understanding of what might happen in humans. But treating animals and treating humans are can be different. I mean, that's very much true. What I have put in the uh, chat is right from our paper talking about amphotericin B in the treatment of canine leishmaniasis because there has been a lot of debate about, about, about using AMP B. As I said, 10, 12 years ago, um, it was a straightforward case that people were using amphotericin B for canine leishmaniasis, um, but that has changed. And therefore I've kind of put in there references as well as a WHO expert committee on the control of leishmaniasis. And they actually do not recommend the use of AMP to treat canine leash. Um, and you can read this in the paper and get the references yourself and see. So there's a lot of debate about this idea of One Health and going back and forth. And the best way to deal with this is actually test it. Take your formulation, take yeah. your drug, and test it in animals, and 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 then and see what happens in an animal setting versus what happens in a human setting. Extrapolating is is not appropriate, uh, and just assuming that it's going to work in one species doesn't mean it's going to work in another. And that's a very that's a very important and good point. But the best way to do it is to test. So back to the yeah. original question: Have you thought about using amphotericin B in dogs or a canine environment? Absolutely. But again. You have to do the testing. You have to see the results. You have to make the you have to make the adjustment based on the data. So, for instance, we might find that the, our oral formulation may not be effective in dogs. We found it effective in mice. We affected affected in hamsters. Um, obviously, we want to do it in humans. Um, we would like to test it in dogs. We were asked to a number of years ago, but we weren't there yet because we hadn't done fishmaniasis in dogs yet. We've only done pharmacokinetics and GLP toxicology. Sorry for that long answer, but I thought it was important in the dialogue that we're seeing in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and that's much appreciated and very much appreciated by doc, for, for uh, Dr. Edubiel Alpizar for making the, those points in, in the chat. He's mentioning about resistance and cross-resistance reports from the clinics uh, and this entire thread on the... Uh, the, the well, you know, the, re the resistance issue yeah. in humans is very controversial because they are one case studies. Um, and, and, uh, and also it is very widely accepted that the sterol binding mechanism of action is still the predominant. I mean, I'm a guy who's worked on AMP for 40 years, so I know it's still the main mechanism of action for amphotericin B. It is widely accepted. I've put a number of references. There has been a lot of work talking about, talking about, um, you know, that there are other mechanisms by which AMP B uh, inhibits systemic fungal infections and so on. A lot of it do with anti-inflammatory, um, uh, INOS and CNOS. And so any, with any of these drugs, there is always multiple mechanisms and, and those mechanisms have been explored. But from a clinical perspective, the sterol binding mechanism is still the predominant mechanism of action. Fantastic. Miguel, would you like any other input onto that, given your veterinary background as well, in terms of uh, this is a disease reservoir? Or... I, I think that the, 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 the major, the major uh, concern about using the same drug for, for treatment of, of animal disease and human disease is the, the rising of, of uh, resistant strain. So, but this, but this, this is a problem that is not being studied very, very uh, in, a, in a very serious way. You know, this as as Kishore's, uh, Professor Kishore says, there are a, 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 there are few uh, the, the, a problem of inter in, in, inter species uh, or, or 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 inter species susceptibility is more is more uh, important than the the race of resistance. Of, of a resistance strain. Yeah, fantastic. So I think that it's not, not, they they are, the problem is not, they are not allowing to test it in some, in, in, in yeah. some regions. So yeah. it, it's, the, this no allowment of, of, the, of the study is that is, I think this is the main problem. 
That's fantastic. And I think, Professor, you've, that's really hit a nerve there. It's Professor, Fashi, uh, P Professor Harandi, Majid Harandi, from uh, Iran, he's saying that, uh, thank you much for the detailed responses. Uh, Dr. Alpizar is saying, it's my pleasure with these questions. And he's going to he's saying, I'll contact both speakers. Fabulous talk. And uh, he himself is working with AMP, the Mechanism of Action and Mechanism of Resistance. So I'm sure you'll have a, a, a continued uh, oh, I, 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 it'd be a pleasure to talk about it because there, yeah. because as I say, no drug, no drug is is resistance free. I mean, it's been very lucky that amphotericin B for many years is not resistance free. But we're starting to see what what's happening. For instance, uh, even the sterol binding theory, um, the the uh, sterol is starting to sit back in the cell membranes of resistance uh, strains. So the MB yeah. can't get in there and bind anymore. And uh, and then there's there's breakdown of the oxygen groups on the backbone of the amphotericin B so that it can't bind. So, um, so there is now starting to see some resistance. Artificially in the lab, you can create amphotericin B resistance, no problem at all. The issue yeah. is, is that up to now, we haven't seen it uh, widespread in the clinic. However, I would be shocked if that doesn't start to happen because uh, just like with antibiotics, there's always misuse. And we're obviously seeing it in the canine community now. And the question is why? What's happening special in the canine community with, with resistance of AMP yeah. that we aren't seeing in humans? Because if it jumps to humans, you're going to lose a major tool, yeah. which is amphotericin B. So these are yeah. critical issues and, and very yeah. important research that needs to be done. And it's and consistently think, a moving target. Yeah, yeah. I, think we, I think you're going to get a lot of feedback from the uh, audience. I'm sure they can contact you both directly, so Professor. But I do think the big picture, about... Cameron, to your message is yeah. that if we want to do serious work in this area and we want serious things on the ground, we need support from people so we can move this yeah. forward. And yeah, unfortunately, I hate to talk about money. It's for me, it's not about money, but you do need that money and resources. So Miguel yeah. can continue to develop these novel molecules, which I would love to test in my animal models and reformulate for him. <laughs> I'd love to take his molecules and, and, yeah. and put it in a way that to, to, to do that, but we need resources and money and we need, we need groups of organizations to help us with this instead of being a control yeah. by a few organizations. And I think yeah. that that's something that's for another day and another discussion. Yeah, that, that, but, yeah. the, the revolution shall not be televised. It shall be live. That's, that's right. Day. I mean, uh, there's I mean, an interesting yeah. input here from uh, Dr. Owen Bicknell from the Mentor Initiative. They run a very, very amazing uh, emergency settings uh, training course uh, for, 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 for doctors in terms of um, emergency settings across the world. And it's more in terms of a vector-borne disease toolkit, what can be deployed. And he mentioned earlier he was in Gezantep in, in Turkey uh, and looking at the northern Syrian uh, response, so both the earthquake as well as the war-torn uh, nightmare that's going on in Syria as well. But Leishmanisis is making a comeback in that setting. So they're there. He's, he's saying that this is more on the oral AMP uh, B. We would love to see oral AMP B rolled out in northern Syria, where we are frequently experiencing all the challenges and uh, parental treatment that you describe. Please keep up the good work. And if and when you get to a stage where you would like to make your fully tested and approved formulation available without cost to humanitarian partners, because that's what mentor are, do get in touch with us and we'll gladly assist in making sure it reaches the health facilities we support. So there's a need out there. So this, there's obviously and absolutely a need on many fronts. But it is this funding question in the middle. Yeah, you know, it's, that's, that, that's fantastic. And I thank yeah. uh, Owen, Dr. Be Becknell, for those wonderful comments. Thank you. Yeah. And yes, I would love to help people in northern Syria and around the world. But I can't do it today because I need the phase two data. And yeah. we're in what they call the valley of death, right? <laughs> we're in between. Well, I, 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 yeah. I do hope that from this very small webinar, you know, we're also limiting what we can do and everything. I really genuinely hope that some real partnerships and collaborations occur. And the wonderful audience of Professor Guiz Ikram Guizani, the head of the lab at the Institute Pastor Tunis, thank you all for this exciting session and discussion. You know, Professor Renovalt from the from the University of Copenhagen, Dr. Alpizar, 
uh, from uh, Professor Harari, all sorts of places from all across the world are looking at this. I re and this is what I was trying to say, that is there a need for, I was just talking referring to database, but actually it's right across the board, a, date, a time for a global response to make a very, very compelling case for any potential funders. This is what I was trying to say earlier. Can we not all join forces and create a super PDP? <laughs> you know, this is this is what I was trying to turn a turn a tease out. But time is a kind of we're over four minutes over our allotted time. I hate to say goodbye. I hope this is the beginning of a conversation. Miguel, I'm pretty certain we're going to come back to you um, as your work progresses, as it rightfully progresses, and you're going to be throwing out more uh, candidates. Um, if you're okay with that, we're definitely going to come back to you and perhaps have another session later on uh, in the year, uh, if, if, that, if that's okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. It will, it will be my pleasure again to, to, to present some, not only in leishman analysis, but we are we are ahead to Chagas disease and, and, and also rapes. So yeah. Yeah. we are going to have some, some, some interesting results. And that's, and that's yeah. really what makes Miguel's work extremely exciting is I think he's using leash as just an example of, of yeah. all the other neglected diseases and other diseases he's working on. And we're in a similar fashion. Uh, we're not a one trick pony. So yeah. um, <laughs> it'd be, it'd be yeah. great to, um, to explore those further. Um, you know, in the case of leishmaniasis, we're far, you know, we're in the clinic. So we're actually going into human subjects and, you know, hopefully in phase two. Um, so, you know, it's a great story. Some of our other things are still at the preclinical stage. So um, mm. that's why we talk about, amp, uh, lipos, yeah. you know, the ampi leash story. But it's just a model to other things that we need we need to get going. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I think, I think everyone, and I thank you for people staying on over time, but I, it shows that there is excitement and interest and, uh, Miguel and I and Cameron appreciate uh, our colleagues for staying online. So thank you so much. And, um, I please, you. you can send me an email and, uh, send me, uh, I'm at kishore.wasan at ubc.ca and, you know, just, uh, um, yeah, we, I love to chat and help people out. Brilliant. So thank you. Thank you both for that. Echoing that, uh, thanks from uh, Professor Wassan and from Miguel. Thank you all lovely people for attending. Thank you so much to the two panelists. If you are around on the 15th and 16th of March, we have our seventh annual ISMTD Festival, which is a unique two days looking at the communication strategies that lie between operational research ending and change occurring at policymaker or community level. If you get a chance, have a look at our website. We've got film awards, television awards, radio awards, apps, data, all sorts of awards going out. It's all on our website. And it's happening on the 15th and 16th of March. Attendance is completely free. We highly recommend that you attend that. You'd be shocked at the the, the, the robust nature of uh, communications that are being put out there for NTDs and global health. Um, and there's going to be a lot more coming out. You mentioned Chagas, Miguel. We have a very special Chagas um, uh, webinar uh, connect coming at, I think, on the 17th of March, actually. But I'll, I'll send sending out some details on that. We've got quite a packed year ahead of us. But again, thank you very, very much. But, uh, Professor Haradi, thank you very much. Uh, for attending and he's saying thanks to us. Dr. Bickner is saying thanks to all for a very interesting and needed discussion. Uh, let's hope for more attention, more funding, strength of partnerships. We're always available for joint advocacy. Professor Gemli, thank you for the speakers and the speakers. Dr. Uh, Professor Guizani, thank you for this exciting session. Professor Venerbalt, thanks for the informative and good talks. And the list is endless. Everybody's saying thanks. Uh, Dr. Dr. Awa Ganeme, thank you for your great talk. So people have loved what, what you said. I think we're way over time and I'm going to have to press the red button, I think. So till next time, everybody. <laughs> All right. Until next time. Thanks. All right. Thank you both very, very much. I've just Thank you very much, that, everyone. Take care. My, my, my camera was off. I just realized that now. I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah. no problem. All right. Take care now. Okay. Thank take you, everyone. Care, guys. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.